Dear guests, a warm welcome to the CAS RSIS Ministerial Forum, the Indo-Pacific Geostrategic Challenges and Opportunities for Germany and Singapore. Conrad Adenar Stiftung and the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies are honoured to facilitate a dialogue between the German Federal Minister of Defence, Annegret Kram Karmbauer, and the Singaporean Minister for Defence, Dr. Ng Eun Hin. You may start posting your questions in the Q&A Zoom function for the Q&A session later. To start the webinar, may I invite Mr. Christian Echler, Director of the Political Dialogue Asia of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung to give the welcome remarks. Mr. Echler. Minister Kram Karenbauer, Minister Dr. Ng, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests. A very good afternoon to those of you who are joining us from Singapore and South Asia and a good morning to our audience in Germany. It is a great pleasure for the regional program Political Dialogue Asia of Konrad Adenauer Foundation to co-host this event together with our dear partners and friends from the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies under the leadership of Executive Deputy Chairman Ambassador Ong Kang Yong. We have come together today to discuss the challenges and opportunities of the Indo-Pacific for Germany and Singapore. And we are absolutely honored to have the ministers of defense from both Singapore and Germany with us to do so. A very warm welcome to Annegret Kram Karrenbauer, the German Federal Minister of Defense, and to Dr. Eng Eng Hen, the Singaporean Minister for Defense. We are equally delighted to welcome Germany's Ambassador to Singapore, Dr. Norbert Riedel, and the EU Ambassador to Singapore, Barbara Plinkert, in the audience. Two and a half months ago, the German government has adopted its first ever strategic guidelines for the Indo-Pacific. On 68 pages, the document is covering a wide range of topics, including security, multilateral cooperation, rules-based trade, climate, rule of law, as well as digital and people-to-people -people connectivity. Germany wants to have an increased engagement in the region in these areas, and in doing so, coherent Indo-Pacific strategy of the European Union. The strategic guidelines have a very clear approach to the ge geopolitical situation in the region. The document states that, and I quote, hegemony as well as the consolidation of bipolar structures would endanger an approach of enhanced and diversified partnerships in the region. No country should be forced to choose between two sides or fall into a state of unilateral dependency. Freedom of choice regarding membership of economic and security policy structures is crucial for Indo-Pacific countries." End of quote. It is noteworthy that the German government officials have emphasized from the very beginning that it is absolutely important for them to receive feedback on the guidelines from the partners in the Indo-Pacific. Minister kram karrenbauer has therefore started a virtual three-station tour through the Indo-Pacific. After the first webinar took place in Australia last week, and before the virtual trip will conclude with a webinar in Japan, Singapore is a natural choice for the second stop of this trip. Minister Dr. Ng and Minister Kram Karrenbauer have met last on the sidelines of the Munich Security Conference in February this year, and Minister Ng highlighted the warm and growing defense relations between the two countries after the meeting, exemplified by the Singapore Armed Forces continued armor training in Oberlausitz, as well as the SAF's submarine program and crew training in Kiel. Before we now have the opportunity to continue the conversation between the two ministers, please allow me to introduce them briefly. Annegret kram karrenbauer has been Federal Minister of Defense since July 2019. She's the chairwoman of CDU, which is the bigger party in Germany's governing coalition since December 2018. Before that, she was the Prime Minister of Saarland, a state in the southwest of Germany from 2011 to 2018. During this time, she also served as the state's Minister of Justice from 2011 to 2012 and Minister of Science and Research from 2012 to 2018. Before 2011, she already had served as Minister in the portfolios of Education, Labour, Interior, Family Affairs, Women 
and sport. Annegret kram karrenbauer is a member of the board of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and a regular guest at our events. Minister, it is wonderful to have you with us today. Dr. Ng Eng Hen is Singapore's Minister for Defense since 2011. He was Minister for Education from 2008 to 2011 and Minister for Manpower from 2003 to 2008. He was first elected as Member of Parliament to, of Bishan Tua Payo constituency in 2001 and subsequently re-elected for the same constituency in 2006, 2011 and 2015. He was Deputy Leader of the House from 2007 to 2011 and Leader from 2011 to 2015. He was trained as a cancer surgeon and has co-founded the Breast Cancer Foundation in this capacity in 1997. He's a regular guest and supporter of the S. Rajaratnam School for International Studies. Dr. Eng, thank you so much for being with us today. The Straits Time will publish an interview with Minister Kam Karrenbauer in the paper tomorrow, and I believe it just went online before the actual start of this event. In the interview, Minister says, we intend to expand security and defense cooperation with those who share our values in the region, such as Singapore, and intensify our military contacts and promote dialogue on matters of security. RSIS and CAS are delighted to facilitate a platform for this dialogue today, and we are looking very much forward to the remarks of the ministers, as well as to the Q&A session with the audience. Again, thank you all for being with us today. I wish us an insightful and engaged exchange in the next 55 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Ashler. The following remarks will be given in German and translated into English. The audience in the Zoom webinar can choose which language to follow with the language option button at the bottom of the window. May I now give the floor to Federal Minister of Defense, Annegret Kram Krambauer, for the remarks from German. Well, thank you very much. Um, my kindest regards from Germany all the way to Singapore, um, especially to my uh, colleague, Dr. Eng, uh, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, Mr. Echle, uh, my warmest greetings here from Germany. And I would, of course, much rather be with you in Singapore today. But the current situation with the pandemic, not only in Germany, but across the globe, makes this impossible, unfortunately. So I'm very pleased that with the help of the Conrad Foundation and the RSIS, we were able to conduct this virtual trip. I'm very happy that I can make this very important stop on my trip this morning in Singapore. It is. It has been mentioned just before by Mr. Eschle that the German government just a few days ago, or weeks ago, I should say, published the Indo-Pacific Guidelines, and it passed it. This is very remarkable also because it's taken a, a long time for us, for our government, to look at a complete entire region to publish a holistic, comprehensive document on it and pass it. The fact that we published this document on the Indo-Pacific region makes it very clear that this region is of crucial importance to us, even though between Germany and the Indo-Pacific, there are tens of thousands of kilometers in distance. So why is that region of such great importance to us in Germany? Well, you may be aware that Germany is a an actor, a trade nation that acts globally. We are an advocate of a rules-based international multilateral order, and that it is in our very own interest and in the interest of our values that we share that we care so much for the security, stability, and prosperity, not only in Europe, but across the globe, including in the Indo-Pacific region. With China, Japan, and the United States, the three largest um, trade nations and economic nations are part of the Indo-Pacific. This area is becoming the new 
motor for growth. The Indo-Pacific region is one of the most densely populated area areas in the world. 22 out of 33 mega cities in the world are located right here. Global trades, trade routes are so important. They go through the Indo-Pacific region and through the Pacific. I must not mention this to anybody in Singapore. You know this very well. Singapore's destiny itself is closely intertwined with the Strait of Malacca. Just looking out of the window, it is enough for you to understand and for all of us to understand that our economies are closely intertwined due to global supply chains. In the first few months of the pandemic, we all um, felt that very uh, clearly. At the same time, and I would like to very openly mention that we can see how the Indo-Pacific region is slowly becoming a stage um, where we witness the competition of great powers. There is a very palpable rivalry between the United States and China. We can see that clearly. And also countries such as Germany who want both meaning good relations, good and close relations with the U.S. in the economy and also in the field of security policy. But at the same time, what we also want is, a, is good relations with China. And so countries who want both of that find themselves in a situation where they are in demand, where they are needed. When we look at the developments, we have to state two things very clearly. The political and economic center of gravity of the world is shifting from the transatlantic area into the Indo-Pacific region. And it is right here where the future international order is being shaped, at least, or it is, it is being shaped, just as it is in other places. Also questions uh, regarding the freedom of navigation are of concern to us in Europe and Germany. If um, stability and freedom like that are compromised in your region, that also has an impact on us here. So for us in the German government, of me personally, one thing rings true. There are true, uh, really strong links between the Indo-Pacific and Europe. And so Germany wants to be a reliable partner and friend of the region and live up to its responsibility for the rules-based order. And we want to help shape that order. This is why we stand up for our interests and we want to do that with a view to the future in a stronger fashion and support that with stronger deeds than we have done in the past. It is in our very own interest and by the way in our shared values that um, existing laws and rules are respected, that human rights and democratic standards are being upheld, that open societies are being protected, that um, sea routes are, can be navigated unimpededly, and that trade is conducted fairly, that um, international law is being respected, even though one might discuss uh, disputed territorial issues. To do that, we need good partnerships, strong partnerships with countries um, with whom we share values and principle, just as with Singapore, countries that, like Germany, advocate the rules-based international order. Our Indo-Pacific guidelines provide a space for um, intensified cooperation with the partners in the region, also in the field of security and defense. And I would like to highlight one thing now. These guidelines they are an offer for increased cooperation. These guidelines are not guidelines or an offer that is against somebody or something. No, instead, these guidelines are an offer to strengthen, the, strengthen something, strengthen values and interests that we share. And these things should be based on strong bilateral relations, but also at the same time, on strong cooperation, for example, with the ASEAN countries. Germany, in all of that, wants to intensify cooperation in security and defense policy with the partners in the region. We want to intensify our military contacts, and we want to promote dialogue and security policy. We do not want to this to be our only uh, focus. No, we also focus on the economic relations, for example, but the security policy aspect must not be forgotten. So what does that mean in more concrete terms? Well, 
It is about a maritime presence at the naval routes. Unfortunately, due to the coronavirus pandemic and also because of other urgent operational commitments in the maritime Mediterranean Sea, we had to postpone our maritime presence in your region that we had scheduled for this year, but we are conducting plans for next year. I just discussed that with my colleague in the talk we had just before the webinar. So and together with European partners, we would like to actually conduct this presence in your region with our partners next year. Another example is um, German Navy officers that can uh, embark on friendly units and also liaison officers that we send to multilateral organizations. For example, we have a liaison officer at the Information Fusion Center in Singapore. He took up his work in early 2020, and this is a great example of what I'm talking about. Of course, there's support visits and participation in military exercises, and all these are things that we have discussed together and also uh, kicked off. In September of this year, I had an exchange with representatives from the ASEAN countries, I think, and I mentioned this earlier, ASEAN plays a central role in order to strengthen multilateral actions. It is important for peaceful conflict resolutions and for dialogue. And two months later, I would like to once again uh, express Germany's clear support for that. For me, it is very clear, together with our partners in the region, we want to show more of a presence in the region, to send a message of solidarity and to make a contribution to the regional security architecture. So for me, this means too that the EU and NATO play a more active role. By intensifying strategic dialogue with our partners that share our values and um, expand partnerships and support each other, we can do just that. NATO is undergoing an interesting reflection process right now. We're focusing on the question as to how we can cooperate better with our partners in the Indo-Pacific region. It is part this question is part of this reflection process. There is also a Franco-German-led EU project called Enhancing Security with and in Asia. And this is a good example of how the cooperation and security policy with the countries in the Indo-Pacific region can be intensified also in the multilateral framework. I'm firmly convinced in order to support peace and security in the region, we all need to pull together. But in order to do that, we need good and intensified bilateral relations. And for us, in all of that, Singapore is a crucial partner in the Indo-Pacific region, and it is an important ally for multilateralism. We share a common imagination of and, and perception of threats and risks. I was very happy, esteemed uh, colleague, Minister Eng, that we got together at the Munich Security Conference earlier this year in Munich to have an exchange on that. This very close link is also mirrored in the new uh, spheres. For example, in our close cooperation when it comes to cyber security and cyber and information space. Singapore is a high-tech location in Asia. In the field of cyber, Singapore offers a wide range of um, potential fields of cooperation. Over the last three years, we have intensified our cooperation in cyber defense between our ministries, but also at command level. In the face of incomparable increasing threats in the cyber and information space, this is important and the right thing to do. What we need to do is, is to make our systems and networks more resilient. And we have to effectively fight disinformation campaigns and we need to strengthen our defense capabilities. Another example are our close ties in armaments. We have a regular armaments dialogue and there is a procurement projects for German submarines and uh, the training of the crews that ensues, etc. And it is good to know that we can build on the trusted partnerships in the face of these common challenges and opportunities in the Indo-Pacific. Our guidelines that we passed in the German government provide the right framework for that. They are a good framework for a close cooperation with ASEAN and for a stronger German presence in the region. For example, 
in military exercises that I just mentioned. And I also advocate that in the framework of partners across the globe, we um, expand our uh, common NATO relations. This is everything from my side for now, and I now look forward to Singapore's perspective on all of it. And I'm excited to hear from you, esteemed colleague, as to how you see things and where you see potential areas of cooperation where we can intensify our trusted and proven uh, cooperation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Minister. May I now give the floor to Minister for Defence, Dr. Ng Eng Hin, for the remarks from Singapore. First, uh, let me thank uh, Minister Ennegret Kramkarambawa for that very clear presentation on Germany's uh, intent and aspirations uh, for the Indo-Pacific region. As in our meeting, short meeting prior to this uh, uh, webinar, uh, I express Singapore's uh, appreciation for that guideline paper which uh, puts out Germany's uh, position. Let me thank uh, RSIS and the Conrad Adenauer Foundation for hosting this. It's a wonderful idea. But as I reminded uh, Mr. Kram Karambau that uh, it makes up a little for her cancel trip to Singapore. And uh, while we understand the reasons, uh, I look very much forward to physically hosting her visit to Singapore and uh, for us to uh, continue our exchanges. Uh, since this is an interactive session, uh, let me make some brief remarks uh, to allow more time for questions and answers. And I thought uh, to start off, let me just say that the theme for this webinar on geostrategic challenges and opportunities uh, is a very well chosen one and right on the mark. All of us recognize that there are many challenges facing this generation today, but the threat to multilateralism and cooperation is the quintessential challenge because it affects the fundamental underpinnings of the stability of current world order. Minister Kramp Karambawa went further to say that she thought there was a shifting in terms of a new world order and that Geographically, the shift uh, is going to be in Asia, and this is where some of the new constructs and the new rules of the road, as it were, will be formulated. But if we look back at the post-World War II construct with multilateralism at its core tenet, I think all of us would agree that that construct resulted in concrete progress, development, and peace for that generation. And we were in that generation that benefited. We grew up, we were in our teens, we worked, we studied. And in the last 70 years or so, we've had relative peace and prosperity. Germany and Japan rose from the ashes to become global powerhouses that rebuilt their economies and capabilities and becoming rightful and legitimate actors on the global stage. Asia, including China and ASEAN, also accelerated in their development. If we were to ask, why was there this global consensus for nearly half a century from 1960s to 2010 that resulted in this virtuous state of affairs? Because the post-World War II multilateralism and cooperation resulted in the structural underpinnings that uh, exist today, exemplified by United Nations, WTO, WHO, IMF, NATO, among others. And I think it arose from two cardinal beliefs. The first belief was the never again moment to avoid the ravages of the prior two world wars that brought untold misery and destruction. And second belief that individual countries would benefit more if we together established and protected the global commons of trade, finance, and security. Predicated, as, my, as Minister Kramp Karambau said, on the rule of law and mutual cooperation. In that construct, countries large or small would gain from this form of globalization. 
Of course, these principles would not have been possible without champions and defenders of that form of multi multilateralism. And the US and Europe played those roles because Asia's rise was nascent at that time. If we were to come to the present circumstances, 2020, what is the state of that carefully constructed framework of multilateralism and cooperation today? We're in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic, but COVID-19 is but a series of global events that have shaken and weakened the very pillars of this framework that we talked about in the last decade or so. The US foreign policy in the last decades has shifted considerably to what is viewed, what it viewed as unfair outcomes that favored some countries at the expense of others, including itself, and therefore it's America first policy. Security wise, the US articulated its position comprehensively and clearly in the 2017 National Security Strategy paper, where they identified China and Russia as strategic rivals, attempting to quote unquote, shake a world antithetically to US values and interests. Quite interesting that my counterpart has agreed that there was a, an attempt or that de facto is a reshaping of the values and interests of a new world order. Whatever the shape and its actors, the effects of their foreign policy were sharper under Trump than the Obama administration. But the belief is deep-seated and entrenched in American politics for decades to come and likely to persist under Biden administration. The second big disruptive change was, of course, China's rise. China's rise presents a challenge to the existing framework too. How can a framework build on democratic and liberal ideals, values, as uh, my counterpart said, accommodate the rise of China, which has a different operating political system? That in itself is another quintessential challenge. This conundrum is amplified because China has risen so fast in economic, technological, social, and military domains to become a global power. The third force, as I see it, is managing tensions related to jihadi terrorism and migration that resulted from the fallout from countries like Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. These twin, twin challenges have strained the existing social fabric of communities in Europe. In ASEAN, we've had, had a longer history as a melting pot of diverse cultures and religions. And perhaps this is another area where the sharing of practices and strategies of integration can take place between our two regions. The sum effect of these deep currents that I've talked about requires a rethinking if not a reworking of our multilateral and global institutions and systems. But we must not in the course of adapting the new circumstances, throw out the baby with the bath water. Globalization 1.0 was not perfect, but it did serve our needs. A regression to parochial nativist and discriminatory policies by any country or all countries will result again in blocks and misaligned interests, which led to previous two world wars. And I think that path it ta is taken will impoverish us all once again. Instead, multilateral organizations must establish more robust global norms, more equitable and effective application of the international rule of law to address inadequacies of the current framework. And we have to recognize that there are inadequacies. In this regard, I am heartened that Germany supports such a system, having been a long proponent of the multilateral order. Germany is one of the founding members of the EU. It also plays an active role in many institutions like the IMF, World Bank, the UN, and NATO. And both Singapore and Germany understand the importance of the multilateral order and advocate an open and inclusive global architecture, one that is built on cooperation, dialogue, partnership and values. Such an order has brought tremendous benefits 
to both our nations and the world. ASEAN, of which Singapore is part of, is EU's third largest trading partner behind the US and China. And US, EU exports to ASEAN amounted to 100 billion in 2019, US 100 billion. Bilaterally, trade between Singapore and Germany reached US 15 billion last year. And the EU Singapore FTA that entered into force last year will increase these flows. In tandem, Singapore's defense relationship with Germany has also grown since the conclusion of our defense cooperation agreement in 2005 and enhanced in 2018. I have attended the Munich Security Conference every year since 2012. As Minister Kram Karambao said, we met last year uh, and I, that meeting was immensely satisfying and enjoyable uh, because of the shared perspectives. I've also been very happy to meet your young leaders in your Munich Young Leaders Program. In turn, Germany defense ministers have also attended Shangri-La Dialogue and made a strong impact by their presence and views for Asia security. Militaries, militarily, our armies frequently interact in information exchange, HADR, and cyber. We are grateful for the Bundeswehr continued support for our training in Germany in Oberlauschitz now, but this started since 2009. And as the minister said, we are very thankful for your international liaison officer at our inter information fusion center. And we're looking forward to receive the invisible class type 218 submarines in 2022, now in Kiel. What is Singapore's response and what is my ministry's response to your position paper on the guidelines for Indo-Pacific? We believe that Germany with its size and global influence can and must do, must play its part to stabilize the international order by what it stands for and practices. We are very happy that you've put out a position paper. We uh, look forward to facilitating the presence of German naval ships in our naval bases. And we look forward to strengthening our military cooperation between our two ministries and armed forces. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. We are now entering Q&A session with the ministers. Please post your questions in the Q&A Zoom chat. The session will be moderated by Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, Executive Deputy Chairman of the S.I. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Ambassador Ong, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope all of you can hear me. Well, we have just heard the two ministers of defense from Germany and from Singapore expressing many of their key interests in each other and also in the respective regions. In the interest of time, since we have so many questions already on our screen, uh, I will not make any more uh, uh, remarks about uh, everything else in ASEAN, which is my area of interest, but I will go straight to pose the questions to the respective minister. I hope Your Excellency Madam Minister in Germany and uh, Dr. Ngen here in Singapore will agree to uh, go into the Q&A session right away. Uh, we hope to have many questions uh, posed to both of you ministers and then uh, we learn from your responses as we go along. Without further ado, um, already there are three or four questions in German language and we have uh, translated it. But basically, Madam Minister Angrek, the interest from these questions is over the role of Germany. Germany, yeah. Uh, the interest is in Germany's uh, Indo-Pacific guidelines. And question they have is whether this will see an increase in German's Germany's role in the region, in Southeast Asia, in the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, there is a question specifically on what does it mean by having an enhanced maritime presence for Germany in the Indo-Pacific? I leave the floor now to 
uh, Madam Minister Angret from Germany to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this question. Let me, with your permission, highlight once again, esteemed colleague Minister Eng, how grateful I am that you highlighted once again how the multilateral order, the way we know it now, came about and how important it is. You also outlined the challenges to it in a time where the threats and challenges for us all are becoming more and more global. And at the same time, we see that there is a certain trend, a certain development that shows more regionalization or a need to find more regional answers. This will not work. A challenge to humanity like climate change can only be tackled in a global approach when all the nations are on board. Terrorism, Islamist terrorism, attacks all of us. It attacks people and targets people in Europe, in Paris, in Nice, in Vienna, and at the same time, um, students in the University of Kabul are targeted. So this is a challenge for all of us. That is why we who share values and interests need to act together and stand side by side. But this multinational order with a view to this shift needs to be redefined and redefended, and we want to do just that in our partnership. So for us, what does that mean? When we talk about free trade relations, freedom of navigation, free sea routes, when we talk about that, we do not only want to talk about it. Instead, we want to send a message of solidarity here. I'm aware of the fact that an ever-present question in the South China Sea, uh, in, the, in the Pacific, is the South China Sea. And so many partners in your region have invited us to join them together with other European partners to be present in the region. Just this year, we talked with our French partners. We had scheduled the presence of a German vessel. It was to participate in exercises and training um, tours due to COVID-19. This was not possible, unfortunately, but we want to uh, do that next year. We are still um, involved in our plans. Also, um, this depends on the plans of other nations um, as to how we can conduct that. What plays a role as well is our operational uh, commitments in the Mediterranean Sea, in UNIFIL and Operation IRINI, and that does have an impact of what we can do next year. But I'm very confident that what we were not able to do this year can be done next year. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, just as a short, quick follow-up, there is a question about whether Germany's Indo-Pacific guidelines and Germany's increased military, sorry, maritime presence in our region will encourage the European Union, the EU, to further enhance its EU Indo-Pacific strategy. So do you see um, ex an expanded role for the EU? Yeah, especially with regard to the momentum set by the uh, Germany's Indo-Pacific guidelines. Bearing in mind that we already have France Indo-Pacific strategy being uh, announced sometime back. So how would all these channel the European Union's effort and interest in the Indo-Pacific? May we have your opinion, please? I just mentioned that the way we look at the Indo-Pacific is a question that is being discussed within the EU and within NATO as well. It is part of NATO's reflection process, for example. The expert group is about to publish its first results uh, as part of the reflection process. And also within the EU, we see a debate that is not only based on national strategies, but also is trying to focus on the question, how can we as a whole, as the EU, work with the partners, for example, with the ASEAN states, 
and how can we commit ourselves to them for the future? The EU just recently said that it does not only have an important trading partner in China, but also that China is indeed a systemic challenge to the EU. So we do conduct this debate at the European level as well. I also said earlier that we're currently facing similar and simultaneous challenges, and it is important that these strategic areas, the European theater, quote unquote, and also the transatlantic friendship, and also the Indo-Pacific region are important when it comes to tackling questions and matters of humanity and that we need to grow together here. And so national initiatives are mirroring are being mirrored in this more intensified European discussion. Thank you, Madam Minister. Maybe I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Ng from Singapore uh, to uh, give his opinion on some of the comments made by the Minister from Germany. But more specifically, there are several questions, uh, Dr. Ng, for you with regard to the rules-based order and how this uh, interest of Germany would uh, help ASEAN, and in particular, in the case of Singapore, manage the issues and challenges in the South China Sea. Uh, perhaps um, uh, you'd like to elaborate a little bit more on what you have said in your opening remarks. Minister. Mm. Thank you, Ambassador Ong. Um, let me put the two questions, both uh, remarks uh, to what my counterpart has said, as well as the questions asked. And I think to focus uh, the remarks, let's start, let me pose this. What is at stake here? What is at stake? Uh, yes, there are disputes in the South China Sea, and Minister Krem Karambao says that the, uh, the center of gravity has shifted to Asia, perhaps this region. And I think what is at stake, uh, without sounding uh, an exaggeration, is indeed a revised world order. And in that revision, ASEAN certainly wants to protect its interests. And ASEAN is no stranger to being a proxy battleground. That's a, a, a phrase used by many of our diplomats who understood that. A proxy battleground for, for strategic rivalry. If you look at the history of ASEAN, it is not very long ago, within our, our lifetime, my lifetime, that we were previously under colonies. And in fact, the last ASEAN country to be independent, only gain its independence in the 1980s, Brunei. And certainly we want to avoid being another proxy battleground for powers outside ASEAN. And yet at the same time, I think ASEAN member states are completely realistic. It can't tell the world stay out of the region and leave us to sort our own architecture because it wouldn't work. Uh, it is a strategic bay, uh, waterway and uh, the amount of oil and goods and supply chains that uh, Minister talked about in her speech is of uh, high magnitude and it's a strategic interest to countries around the world. If you try to look for a, a region or a water basin, which is equivalent to a strategic importance, you'll be the Mediterranean, I think including the Suez Canal. And nobody speaks about keeping uh, user states outside the Mediterranean or the Suez Canal. So it's not practical, even if ASEAN wants to do it. Uh, you can't keep people out. And I think ASEAN has understood this, and which is why ASEAN seeks for, and Singapore seeks for an inclusive architecture, whether it's for trade, whether it's for finance, whether it's for security, but predicated on those who want to enter the region to accede to, for example, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation and to settle disputes by uh, legal means rather than by other means. 
And I think if we stick to these principles, I think that ASEAN guards and protects its own interests. And in that light, the question for both ASEAN, for Germany, for EU, is what role does Germany, France, or the EU want to play in this setting up of the new international order? Can it afford to be a marginal state? And can you be on the table discussing these aspects? My uh, esteemed colleague, Professor Jaya Kumar says, if you're not on the table, then you're, not, you're on the menu, <laughs> as he puts it. And in relation to that, can countries without a security and military presence and influence shape this new world order? And I think those are questions that will define what the next generation will face, either disorder or cooperation and multilateralism. Thank you, Minister. The interesting thing is the last number of questions on how Germany sees itself um, or how ASEAN sees itself in the light of the US electoral uh, outcome, the presidential election in the US. Can Madam Minister and uh, Singapore Minister Dr. Ng, uh, give us your quick take on how you see the immediate response uh, or impact on this uh, scenario that you have uh, sketched for us with regard to the Indo-Pacific and in Southeast Asia. Yeah, there is so many, there is so much interest on yeah, the impact of the US and the US president on what is happening in Indo-Pacific and in the South China Sea. I guess this all has to do with what Dr. Ng say, yeah, uh, the uh, rise of China and uh, China's role in the international arena. So perhaps Madam Minister Angret, um, let us hear you first and then we can uh, go to Dr. Ng in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you. China, as I just mentioned, for us in Europe, in Germany, and I'm sure that is true for the US side too, is an important partner for us to solve important global questions and uh, it's an important trading partner, but at the same time, it is a systemic challenge because if you look back at history, it is a country that shows or has shown with a certain state capitalism that you can be successful economically without limiting the liberal world or without having a liberal world order that we have. So it is a systemic challenge. I believe that when you look at the U.S. elections and its outcome with the new and Joe Biden, we will be experiencing an administration that will give more weight to multilateralism and international cooperation than the acting president has done. I will be less disruption in the political business. We will hear a different uh, tone of voice. But a hard fact is that the US side will, yes, it will continue to want a good transatlantic relationship, but when it comes to the uh, systemic challenge with China in the Indo-Pacific, 
It will look at that further, and we need to respond to that. We will need our, our relationship with the US in NATO, for example, needs to be put on a better footing. We want to have a better partnership that means that we are less dependent on the American side, for example, by making sure at the moment, a large part of the NATO capabilities are still provided by the US. And to a certain degree, we need to develop our own capabilities more, not in order to disrupt our, trans uh, our relationship with the United States, but because we see that the strategic interest of the Americans is shifting to a certain degree, as we are noticing today, two different regions of the world, and we need to be prepared for that. And in the sense of fair burden sharing, um, we have that freedom. So on the one hand, we need to develop our own better capabilities in the sense in, in our, when it comes to the transatlantic relationship, but also in terms of a rules-based international order that has as a core tenet not to enforce interests through might makes right, but based on internationally agreed rules by agreeing that territorial conflicts can be resolved by international arbitration rather than violence. So that is the basis of um, a rules-based global order, and it is of paramount importance for us, and that's why we want to stand up for this order and to pick up on what Dr. Eng said, especially for Europe and for Germany, it would be stupid to withdraw and to return to the margins and send out the message that my uh, colleague said, well, put us on the menu. No, we are one of the strongest economies in the world, and we have responsibility for shaping the world order, and we want to deliver on this responsibility, not on our own, but together with our partners in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Thank you, Madam Minister. Maybe I should just do a quick follow-up because there are a few questions on specifically what Germany can do uh, in the light of the Indo-Pacific guidelines Germany has uh, published with ASEAN uh, cooperation. Yeah, specifically, what Germany and ASEAN can do together pursuant to the Indo-Pacific guideline that Germany has issued. And also on the bigger level, what Germany and ASEAN can do beyond the defense security arena. In the Indo-Pacific guidelines, we named a series of areas for action where that we want to address in bilateral, but also ASEAN cooperation, uh, cooperation in multilateral organizations, cooperation not just in defense and security, but also in make questions in trade, but also cooperation in science, for example, when we, when it comes to addressing the big global questions, for example, research in climate neutral and climate friendly fuels, that's something that is important for, all, for the entire 
world and humanity. And I'd like to pick up on what Dr. Eng said. He said to learn from each other how to deal with migration, for example. What does it mean for the recipient countries and cultures? What are the experiences that you have made in this respect? What can we maybe learn from that in Europe? And I think those are really important points that we can have an, ex an exchange on. For Europe, the immediate neighborhood with to Africa plays a big role. We see that the African continent is a very young continent. There are many opportunities there, but currently there are also immense challenges there. For example, scourges like uh, terrorism that makes people flee their countries. And here we Europeans need to engage stronger. And I know that in the international peacekeeping missions, representatives of ASEAN states are always partners on our side. So here we have common interests too. I believe that we have a wide range of topics to in our portfolio of cooperation. And I said that earlier, uh, there's a new dimension now, the cyber and information space, space, new technologies. And here too, it's important to establish a new rules-based order and not just to allow the law of the jungle. I think this is a really important point. Many of the ASEAN states are really uh, top class technology states and I say it very openly and critically too, we Germans and we Europeans, we can learn a lot from you. And I think it can be a very productive cooperation that we want to intensify. Thank you, Madam Minister. Before I move to Dr. Ng, there are two questions from uh, the audience uh, because uh, in the past few years, the Trump administration's has advocated the withdrawal of US forces from Germany. And now with the Biden uh, 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 election, there are speculation in the newspaper, in the media that maybe this proposed withdrawal of uh, American forces from Germany might be slowed down or completely changed. Um, the questions asked is for your views on this. I don't know whether it is Timely, but maybe you can just say something in response to these two questions. The US troops and the German population have a very long standing friendship for many decades, and I, yesterday I spoke with my new American counterpart about this, for many decades, American soldiers have been at home here in Germany, and we are prepared to offer them a home here in the future too. So the decision that was announced, first of all, that's a national decision by the Americans and for us, it's important to note that it did never mean a withdrawal from Europe or from NATO territory, but there is no exact plan yet on how this withdrawal is to take place. And as part of the election campaigns, we heard that if Joe Biden was elected, that these plans would be scrutinized again. We are in close contact with the current American administration, but also with the actors of the incoming personnel. And we will certainly talk calmly about this question once more. Thank you, Madam Minister. Well, uh, let me pass the floor to uh, the time to Dr. Ng, uh, specifically Minister Ng. Um, people are very keen to know your views or Singapore's uh, uh, view on the uh, US election and uh, what it means for uh, ASEAN, for our uh, Southeast Asia 
defense diplomacy and uh, the situation in South China Sea. Over to you, sir. Thank you, King Yong. It's obviously a question on uh, all government leaders because American foreign policy uh, has been a significant force over our lifetimes and the decisions by uh, the new president will shape uh, any structure globally. So uh, if I may start from that point of view, will American foreign policy change vis-a-vis uh, -vis particularly China and ASEAN? Not so much ASEAN, but I think the question that people are asking, will it change towards China? And let's uh, grab the, that bull by the horns. Uh, we should remember that if we start from the ascension, ascension of China to the WTO as a focal point so that we can crystallize our thinking uh, in the 80s. And there was that promise of uh, China integrating, integrating in the global system. And there were hopes and aspirations. And uh, remember that this was bipartisan support for China's entry into the WTO in the 1980s. And it was under a democratic President Clinton, a democratic administration that uh, supported China, but it had bipartisan support, as it did also EU. I mean, the EU was, uh, you were talking about the post-Berlin Wall uh, coming down, the peace dividend, and there was that zeitgeist that globalization 1.0 was indeed gaining momentum. And indeed, I think there was a much progress. Fast forward to 20 years later, as we said, the 2017 National Strategic Security Strategic Paper by the US under the Trump administration, and there seems to be a vault phase with decoupling, with strategic rivalry, with uh, other aspects. As I said in my opening remarks, I think these feelings are too entrenched now in American politics, whether it's Democratic, Republican, even outside the political domains to think tanks, to their media and so on, uh, to have that, if you like, that same exuberance when China acceded into WTO. There will be some pushback, the feeling that not all rules were complied with, and if rules were complied with, then not the spirit and so on and so forth, and that uh, China gained more, more than what it gave up. I mean, that's open for argument, but those are the perceptions. So I don't think much of that will change. In, in Perhaps in approach, in form, there may be some moderation, but I think it remains to be seen. But I think that strain that uh, there needs to be a recalibration of American foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis China is entrenched in both, whether it's Republican or Democratic. For ASEAN, uh, as we rightly end Singapore, we have learned to work, for Singapore at least, we've learned to work. Uh, I won't speak on behalf of ASEAN ministers, but for Singapore, we've worked with Democratic and Republican administrations equally well. We are able to find, forge common cause, common ground. Uh, and uh, I think we will continue to navigate this. But as Minister Krem Karambao said, the essence is the core principles, the rule of law, uh, that both small and large states have access and mutual benefits and peaceful settlement of disputes. So I think I, I think even under the Biden administration, they will, it will continue. And I think we can find space. I would like to leave uh, that discussion with this question between US and China. Is this a case of unresolvable differences, whether it's US, China, whether it's EU and China, or other countries with China? Is this a case of irreconcilable differences, whether it's in values or practices? Is this a case of an uh, immovable force meeting a uh, unstoppable force, meeting an immovable object. I don't think so. 
China has much to lose as it has to gain from, from uh, uh, breaking down the multilateral system, as does the US. And the question, I think, the diplomatic challenge, the security challenge is, how do we forge common cause and find common ground? And I think as leaders, that to us is uh, the responsibility that we have to undertake. Thank you, Minister. I think the important point to take away from your remarks and that of uh, um, Minister Angret in uh, Germany is that all our countries in Indo-Pacific or in Europe do not want to have this choice of uh, uh, do, do not want to make a choice. They prefer to uh, operate with both the big powers, the great powers, and there are much to be gained from working with uh, the United States of America and with China. So I think we in Singapore and our friends in Germany, yeah, we'll have to uh, share more experiences and our regular practices and thinking in order to help each other to navigate this middle ground. But as a former Secretary General of ASEAN, I must also make a pitch for ASEAN. Yeah, as Dr. Ng said, yeah, we have in ASEAN faced this dilemma too. China is just next door to us in ASEAN and uh, China is now playing a big role on the world stage. Yeah. So perhaps uh, we go back to our traditional uh, skillful job, which ASEAN uh, was blessed with in the earlier decades. That is uh, to avoid having this proxy rivalry and proxy competition in Southeast Asia. We use ASEAN to bring everybody together. Europe, uh, United States of America, China, Japan, India, everybody that matters. So I look forward to Germany and Singapore uh, cooperating in the future uh, to help ASEAN uh, accomplish this very challenging task. For now, the time is almost up. Actually, there are many questions to both of you ministers with regard to how uh, specifically Germany and Singapore can work on issues like uh, doing the work through the IFC in Singapore, the Information Fusion Center, and what does it mean for uh, German to increase its uh, uh, maritime presence in the region, how it connect with the European Union's position and so on and so forth. But I think we will leave that for another occasion. Yeah the uh, exchange here today uh, has to close. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, both minister, uh, the defense minister of Germany and uh, Singapore for spending time with us this afternoon or this morning in Germany. Uh, we appreciate your uh, uh, candid responses and we look forward to even more uh, such kind of uh, uh, exchanges and Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you, Ambassador Ong. I think you did a marvelous job as moderator of this Q&A session, combining more than 30 questions in a way that gave us the most insights. But I think we can take on your cue. I think it's clear that all of us hope that there will be a physical meeting between the ministers soon here in Singapore. And um, I do hope that there will be also time for another CAS RSIS event uh, during this visit. I would also like to thank both ministers for the insights that they shared during the remarks and the Q&A session. I can only highlight what Ambassador Ong said. I think there are more opportunities than challenges and it is now our responsibility to embrace these opportunities when it comes to cooperation between Germany and Singapore and to work on reducing the hurdles that might be posed by existing challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, in the name of RSIS and CAS, 
let me thank both Minister Annegret kram karrenbauer and Minister Dr. Ng Eng Hen for the thoughtful and thought-provoking speeches, as well as for the time that they gave for an exchange with the audience. Let me also thank Ambassador Ong and the whole team of RSIS for the wonderful cooperation that we've been enjoying for the last few years and continue to enjoy. And I would like to thank both teams at CAS and RSIS. Um, it's quite a different game to set up such a ministerial forum in an online space uh, compared to in a hotel room or in a boardroom. Uh, so I think it went quite well. I saw that we had few minor technical issues, but in general, um, I think it was a smooth operation. And I would like to thank the teams at CAS, the teams at RSIS, but also at the ministries uh, for making this possible. I would like to thank Colonel Michael Kamera at the Defense Attaché at the German Embassy for being an excellent liaison officer uh, between us and between the German ministry. And um, I do hope, as I said, that we will soon have the opportunity to all meet again in person. Please continue to be engaged in the discussion that we started today. Please continue to follow the work of RSIS and Konrad Adenauer Stiftung on this. And with that, I would like to wish you a good day in Germany, a good afternoon in Singapore, and thank you so much. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the CAS RSIS Ministerial Forum, the Indo-Pacific Geostrategic Challenges and Opportunities for Germany and Singapore. Both Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies would like to thank you for your participation. Have a good day ahead. Goodbye.